All right, everyone, we're going to uh, we're going to get our next our next session going, and uh, a little bit of good news. We're going to start uh, after this session. We'll have one more, but we're going to have a little wine tasting. We'll get that started after this session because everyone looks a little bit thirsty. So that'll make the last session really fun. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about cannabis tourism and what the potential impact it might mean for the wine industry. And I've got a great panel up here um, to speak to this. We've got uh, Laura Lassiter, Brian Alpagarth, Alicia Rose, and Eric Sklar. And I'm going to let you guys tell the audience a little bit about who you, you know, your background, and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. Okay, um, thank you, and thank you for inviting us here today. We're really excited to be here. Um, came down here uh, yesterday from Humboldt County. Um, I'm Laura Lassiter, uh, Director of Operations for the Southern Humboldt Business and Visitor Bureau. Uh, been part of uh, Humboldt County since the late 70s, um, but have had the opportunity to um, work outside in the corporate world in hospitality and retail for a few decades, so it's allowed me some unique perspective of uh, what's going on uh, here with cannabis and tourism and Southern Humboldt and Humboldt County as a whole. So thank you. Great, Laura, thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Alicia Rose with Herba Buena. Uh, I founded the company about four years ago because Four years ago as a wine industry professional of 18 years prior to that, um, I was realizing that there was absolutely no cannabis or cannabis dispensaries or cannabis experience that I wanted to be a part of. Uh, I also found out that there was a lot of um, issues with purity and potency and therapeutic effect and those being the most important things for cannabis and for consumers. So I started Herba Buena uh, in 2015 and released the country's first ever certified biodynamic cannabis. Uh, today, I consider ourselves a conscious lifestyle cannabis company. Prior to that, though, I consulted for wineries, mostly in Napa, but also in Sonoma and even internationally. So these are two of my favorite topics, and um, I've been a big part of the tourism economy, consulting for lots of wineries in Napa for years, um, and am really excited about what we can do to bring cannabis to elevate that experience. Thanks, Lisa. Brian? Uh, Brian Applegarth, um, founder of Emerald Country Tours and the California <laughs> Cannabis Tourism Association. Um, the association was founded in November 2017. Um, really just saw the need for somebody to stoke the cannabis tourism conversation at the state level and kind of understand how it evolves in, a, in an economy in California where travel and tourism is a major industry. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here and uh, yeah. Great, thanks. My name is Eric Sklar. I'm the CEO and founder of Fume. We're a vertically integrated cannabis company. Our goal is to build Napa brands. Um, we're currently uh, growing in Lake County since Napa doesn't allow it. Um, our three principles are all uh, either in or for, formerly in the wine business. Alicia Hamburg, our COO, is, uh, like I, is a recovered uh, vintner. Um, our other, <laughs> our other uh, co-founder is, uh, is Jake Cloverdance of One Hope Wine. Um, my previous gig was starting Alpha Omega Winery in Rutherford. I uh, started in 05 and sold it in 13. Um, and before that, I was in the, uh, in the restaurant business. I started a chain of burrito uh, restaurants called Burrito Brothers back on the East Coast. Um, uh, also, Alicia and I have co-founded, uh, are board members of the recently founded Napa Valley Cannabis Association, and I'm thrilled to talk about the combination and, and, and similarities between wine and cannabis. So just to kick things off, as a, uh, someone who spent his, almost his entire career in the Sonoma County side of uh, the wine industry, um, and always sort of looking at what's happening over Napa, I'll, I'll start with you, Eric, and, and ask you, from a tourism perspective, right, knowing how important that is um, to, the, to the wine industry, What's happening with, with Napa as it relates to, you know, cannabis in, in Napa and the, and the wine industry and Napa Valley Vintners, et cetera? What, what can you share with us about that? Yeah, you know, we're just getting started. Uh, because the wine industry is so dominant in Napa Valley, it's been a challenge getting people on board with the idea of cannabis, getting them comfortable with it. Um, but the important thing to know about Napa's brand and the tourism there is that wine is certainly the leading concept in the, in, in the brand, but it's not the only thing. The reason Napa has been so successful as a brand is, a, is many fold, but one of the things is, is that it's a, it's a combination of cooperation between the hotel folks, the restaurant folks, the Chamber of Commerce, um, health, health and, 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 and outdoor recreation. All of those things are part of what draws people to Napa and therefore brings them to our wineries. Um, and so uh, you know, that's really been a huge part of our success. And so what we're saying is cannabis should just be one more of those items that brings people to Napa Valley. And, and Alicia, do you want to? 
layer onto that a little bit? Yeah, or? absolutely. Um, I've worked with dozens of wineries in Napa, and I know a lot of the really incredible winemakers and vintners, and there's a lot of misconceptions about what cannabis really means. And I was lucky enough prior to legalization to be able to legally host cannabis and wine events. Um, and it was a really extraordinary uh, opportunity um, to help dispel a lot of that sort of... Um, misinformation and, you know, sort of help people get over that initial taboo. It's amazing that there are still so many vintners out there that are still afraid of it because of the federal illegality, which I can completely understand. Um, but that's why I'm so excited to be here to, to talk about that and to spread good information and to help people understand how they can integrate this incredible therapeutic spirit plant into projects that they already have and elevate the experience overall. Great. Um, Brian, for, for you, what, what sort of experiences have you had, you know, as it relates to cannabis tourism and, mm -hmm. and working with the wine industry or wineries in, in particular? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's, for wineries, um, it's just the conversation, it's the educational gap is what I keep coming back to. It's, uh, emotions aside, it's all a gap of communication and education. So the fact of the matter is, specifically in this region, um, we grow the finest cannabis in the world here. So knowing that puzzle piece, now it's like, how do you, how do you make that fold into the greater brand of Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino? Um, so with wineries specifically, it's not necessarily just wineries, but in the greater travel and tourism industry in general, which is who I deal with as hoteliers as well and transport companies, because cannabis is the new kid on the block. And there's a lot of confusion around what is legal, what's not legal. And how does cannabis tourism live? What is it? Is it a beer tour? Is it a wine tour? You have this health and wellness component where you have, uh, you know, you have a scale where there's cannabis that has no you know, psychoactive effect. There's a lot of strains out there that don't have that. So um, the educational gap is really where I think we need to focus on for wineries. So just as a follow-up to that, you, you talked about the, the, the partnerships with the hotel properties right. as an example. And so, right. of course, on the, you know, the winery side of things, um, those are very important relationships to mm -hmm. us and, and vice versa. Right. Um, how, how has that been with them? Are they reluctant? Are they open to it? I mean, is it, are they, what's, how's I think that the going? ones that, I think the, the ones that I'm mostly engaged with, it's not about reluctancy or embracing. It's about the fact that there's people showing up to their concierge saying, I'm here, I heard you have great cannabis. Get me some weed. What can I do? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. <laughs> So they're trying to respond now. It's becoming a response tactic instead of being out in front of it. And I recently had a meeting with one of the leading B&Bs in Sonoma County, and his exact words were, I want to get out ahead of the curve, because people are showing up wanting to have these sophisticated, educational, empowering experiences in the name of tourism. And it's a fascinating landscape, because tourism is becoming kind of the gate of entry for the first experience and the tip of the spear for education. So instead of putting our head in the sand, let's figure out how to be that luxury level of cannabis sophisticated events, tourism, what is the narrative, let's talk about our culture, our history, um, and I think that's the direction we should go. Can I second that? Because, um, you know, I, because I was an early adopter in Napa Valley, and in fact, Alicia Rose is, Rose is my middle name. I think I talked about this last year. Uh, I used my middle name because I was really afraid early on that, that my wine community in Napa would literally excommunicate me if they knew yeah. that I was starting a cannabis company. I don't feel that way anymore, but I'm still using that name for my cannabis company. Um, but, you know, I have vintners reaching out all the time. Hey, can you deliver like a cool little box? Or I have customers coming to the winery all the time and they're longtime customers that have come to Napa or Sonoma for years and years and they want something new, right? They want to do something different. They, it's no, how many times have wineries in here heard from their wine club members, my wine cellar is full, I have to leave your wine club. Yeah. How many times have you heard from your tasting room staff, I don't want to see four o'clock tastings because everyone's drunk. These are all things that we can help to, to alleviate and to elevate and really continue to have that conversation and provide people what they want. There are dozens of hotels, and I won't mention names, but some of the highest end hotels in our kind of tri-state area or uh, tri-county area that the concierges call me all the time saying, I have to ask you secretly because we're corporate owned and they won't let me talk about cannabis to the customers. What do I do? Everyone's coming in and asking for it. So these are things that we have to communicate about and, and start a dialogue about because give the people what they want. Great. So Laura, this is for you. You know, you, now you're coming down from Humboldt to be with us, right? So Humboldt's obviously got a you know a great reputation for cannabis, right? That, that's that's very well known. But you've got an emerging wine industry uh, in Humboldt as well. Are are you having dialogue with the wine industry up there, and what's that been like? 
Uh, we do. We're having a dialogue, I guess you could say, with just about everyone up in Humboldt mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure out um, what the best guest experience is going to look like. Um, working with our winemakers, working, we've got a new brewery that opened up in the Lost Coast, um, working with our local hotels, um, the Humboldt Lodging Alliance is partnered with our bureau here, um, as well as with our farmers. Um, and, and creating dialogue on how to navigate the next step for Humboldt County. Great. George, I, I mean, I, I would just add, you know, that the key thing here is to, is to figure, figure out what it is you're really trying to do, right? What's the most important thing? And the most important thing is you're providing hospitality in the end when we're talking about tourism. All the different things we've talked about, whether it's hotels and restaurants, transportation companies, it's about providing hospitality. If you start from that point, you'll build in a successful conversation. So, so to pile on to that, um, give me some examples of how you think you, or how you see these, the two industries working together in the future to promote tourism? You yeah, you know, it's the same way that, uh, that, that hotels and restaurants have worked with wineries in the past. It's, you know, at, at Alpha Omega, we were one of the first wineries to open up right after the, what was called the Grand Home Decision, which allowed direct shipping of wine throughout the country. So we built our model on direct to consumer. Well, to do that, we had to build our business based on hospitality. Well, we didn't end up doing any average, traditional advertising. All of our business came we were on Highway 29, but we found it wasn't even people just driving by. It was hotel concierge, sommeliers at restaurants, limo drivers who, when they were asked, where should we go next, they said, why don't you try out this new winery, Alpha Omega? It didn't happen by accident. It's because we built the relationships with those folks. We would have parties for drivers one night, hotel concierges another night, where we taught them about our wine, explained what our, our philosophy was, and had them enjoy the hospitality that we were going to show the guests they were recommending, so they knew they were sending people to a place they would enjoy. So, so do you see that same model basically reoccurring from uh, uh, an association perspective and the association inviting uh, the other key stakeholders? A absolutely. Association plays a critical role in that. We were talking with earlier with, uh, with George and I with Craig, Clay Gregory, who is, a, is a, a, a major leader in the wine industry, both in Sonoma and in Napa, has run some of the most well-known wineries. And, uh, and you know, what we talked about is that you ha a rising tide lifts all boats that the associations and associations across the industry, so the hotel association, the restaurant association, the chamber of commerce, and so on, all have to work together to build that message of hospitality and inviting people to come and experience your place. Mm -hmm. And if I can touch on that as well, um, you know, there's, I, because I get to work with so many different wineries, um, you know, we've had a lot of complaints this year and kind of across the board, it seems that, especially in Napa, and I can't speak as much for Sonoma, um, that, that tourism and direct to consumer sales of people walking in the door is actually a little bit soft this year. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the old guard, the boomers that used to come and buy your $300 Cabernet and their cellars are now full and there's only so much that they can drink before they die. Um, and that, that we've got to start, we've got to start developing more and more and more um, ways to reach new target audiences. And so when we talk about women, we talk about millennials, there is nothing better to draw them in than talking about health and wellness and something new. And those are two huge demographics that have been terribly overlooked by the wine industry. This is gonna offer people a whole new reason to come. We have wineries now that are starting to use their, their, uh, their brands as, uh, you know, and licensing their brands to <coughs> cannabis companies so that they can have their own cannabis brand. Um, you know, they're getting ahead of it and they're being forward thinkers and I think that they're gonna, they're gonna end up doing really well because of it. Great. Lauren. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, it's, it's kind of the same thing for Humboldt as well as um, hum, cannabis is just a part of Humboldt County. It's integrating that into the guest experience that want to tour through the Avenue of the Giants or go take a hike uh, through the King Range. It's um, kind of integrating it into the package of Humboldt County and what does that look like? George, I'd like to talk about one thing to watch out for in the early in this process. You know, uh, uh, I, my friend Tara, Tara Carver from Humboldt, uh, you know, emphasized that Humboldt wants to be the Napa of cannabis. I emphasize we are the Napa of cannabis. <laughs> but, 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 but it's great that everybody wants to follow that. There, there, there's some great lessons to learn from Napa, and one of them is actually a negative lesson. I really recommend that each of these counties 
look at when they're doing it. Don't just include the industries that we've talked about. Include your community in this process of building the tourism that you want. Napa's hit a point now where there's a real conflict between the community and wineries. The community's blaming wineries for the traffic, for other things that are going on. And I see that as a failure on our part, not to have gotten ahead of that really early on, knowing that was coming. And if you can address, start addressing that from the beginning, thinking about the unintended consequences of the development you want. There's all kinds of positive developments. Jobs, you know, increased tax revenue, um, you know, bringing the growing out of the illegal growing and, and doing it without damaging our streams and our, our, our natural resources. But think about the, the negative impacts and address them from the very beginning by including your community and talking about how tourism can be a wonderful part of your community and not become one that becomes an us versus them thing. And, a, and a, I'm sorry. Right. Right. Well, Brian, and, about, ahead, yeah. and about supporting your community, um, the history here is small farmers. I mean, we have boutique cannabis. There's a long legacy and yeah, they were underground, but this is from back to the land movement. This is part of, this is people that we live side by side and spend dollars in our economy. And there's magic there. I mean, think of the prohibition tunnels and all the tourism elements that surround a legacy with that kind of narrative behind it. So I think supporting your community is also supporting the small farms, the sun-grown cannabis, and integrating and enshrining that culture and all the things that make our region uniquely different than any other place that cultivates cannabis in the world, and what is that? Because there's a lot there if we start peeling back the layers. So once we get that information, then we can fold it in, again, to that diversified brand, which good business is diversified anyway. So let's figure out how they complement. And just like the wine business, you know, there's a lot of fear of big corporations coming in and taking over. It's happening to some extent, but you can overcome that by small growers and the community grouping together to promote small growers and talk about why craft is so different than corporate. And artesian products. We have our, our, our corridor here also are innovators of artesian, like well-crafted, thoughtful, they're innovators. People were juicing cannabis in this corridor back you know, 10 years ago, and that's just catching on now. So if we realize that we're at the forefront of innovation from like, a manufacturing standpoint as well, um, there's a lot of special ideas. As far as direct um, synergy between cannabis and, and wine, you know, I'm really excited about the idea of pairings. And there's cannabis strains that, that their signature effect is boosting appetite or accentuating your palate. So now imagine if the narrative goes from here's a cannabis that pairs well with a great wine tasting or, or like a farm to table dinner, you know. Let's start looking at cannabis and don't think of it necessarily as wine and craft beer. There's this health and wellness component. There's all these different strains that it's not just all high THC. You have one to ones and you have ones with none. It's like a caffeine scale. You can have non-caffeinated tea or highly caffeinated tea. It's the same with cannabis and THC. So we need to start understanding that and all the different methods of ingestion as well. It's a really complex, interesting, fun plant once you start embracing it. And not to say there's not, it's not being embraced in this room, but again, it's communication and education back and forth. So I'm gonna uh, go back to something that uh, Alicia said because I've heard a lot of this um, over the last few months about you know, tasting room sales being down, uh, traffic being down, um, you know, some folks speculate it's, you know, it's a little bit of a hangover from the fires last year. Um, but more often than not, you hear the, you know, the, the folks just complaining like, we just can't accommodate another taste room. And now we've got to deal with cannabis too. Like, enough is enough. Like, we can't, we just don't want it anymore. But what do you say to, to those folks on the winery side, because I want to bring it back to that, um, who are worried that, you know, now, my slice is already pretty thin, now it's just gotten a little bit thinner. How do you respond? How has it gotten thinner? No, that, but that's the fear, right? So now, it used to be, you know, uh, I just had to compete with the taste room on you know, the right and left of me, now I've got a whole other industry mm. that I'm gonna have to compete with with regard to tourism dollars. So what do you say to those folks? Well, I mean, thus far, I don't think anybody's come out with any research that says that cannabis is gonna take over the fine wine market or even the mass wine market. I think exactly the opposite is happening. It, you know, people, all, Surprise, surprise, people already use cannabis, <laughs> a lot of them. And a lot of them have just done it in the dark and in the quiet and you know, kept it their little dirty secret. And it, it, it didn't decrease wine sales then and it's not going to now. Um, you know, and this, this concept that, oh, wine and cannabis must mean that you're sticking them together. Right? Or that um, it has to now be kind of one experience. Well, it doesn't, right? I'm, I'm a huge fan of being a purist. Like, I want my beautiful glass of Cabernet or, you know, whatever it is, and I want my beautiful.
beautiful cannabis product, and then I want to have some beautiful food with it. These, you know, experiences can add, add a whole nother layer and dimension um, that is going to help invite new traffic, invite people that are now interested, invite people who it was their dirty little secret, and now they get to do it out in public with their friends. Um, you know, this idea that wine branding and sales, and especially direct to consumer sales, is all about relationship. There's really no better way to form deep, connected, authentic relationships than over a little bit of cannabis. Here's the reality yeah, too. Yeah. Cannabis, as Alicia said, cannabis has been there a lot anyway. It's, and it's coming in a great, to a greater degree. So you, you can put your head in the sand and say it's not, and, right. and that's not gonna work either. So I think cannabis and wine working together is best for both in the long run. Brian, you have anything else to like later Yeah, on? I mean, I keep going back to that sophisticated, like, kind of luxury market. We have the Emerald Triangle emerged as basically a seed bank from the hippie trail. So, you know, in the Emerald Triangle, we have amazing <laughs> genetics. Part of those genetics are land race strains. And these are basically different varietals that come from different places in the world that have different effects that grow differently. It's that connoisseur level. So as we kind of innovate cannabis tourism, especially in our home here, I would urge us to communicate, be open, and to look at that sophistication and figure out what those connection dots are with varietals of wine, cannabis, how do they relate? Let's kind of, uh, let's kind of lead that conversation. Brian just did what he just described. You know, he's, he's, it's that teaching and communication. That's what happens in a tasting room. That's what it's all about. Education that goes along with it. I mean, that's the dialogue that has to exist. Do you see a future um, world where the winery associations and the cannabis associations are pooling resources and uh, combining resources to, to put on joint events and things of that nature? For sure, you know, the first step is getting everybody comfortable with it. And in our effort to write an ordinance in Napa, we've met extensively with the Vintners Association, with the Farm Bureau to get them on board. We've gotten their input. So that's the first thing, you know, building trust by helping devise the ordinances and write the ordinances together. I'd love to see a cannabis lot at the Napa, uh, you know, Napa wine auction. That would be a it's great thing. It's coming. It's coming, right? It's, I've been you know, asked about Premier Napa Valley right. as like the soft entry point, but. <laughs> and, and, and again, going back to what the work that, for instance, Visit Napa Valley does, the work Clay Gregory does, that's exactly what he's done with restaurants and hotels and wineries. We just have to add cannabis to that, to that mix so we all work together. And I, I do want to say that, you know, as this has been the hardest thing I've ever done to run a vertically integrated cannabis company through this process of legalization. But the one thing that I have actually learned is um, we have, like, we're at a place in time right now in, in this society and in this place, in this world, um, right here and now, that we have the ability to really affect change and to shape policy and to shape perce perception. And nobody is going to do that better than wine country. We're so good at telling stories and building relationships. And as hard as it has been to be a part of that process, because sometimes, you, you know, you get one thing out of 10 that you wanted to see happen. Um, it's been really enlightening to see that we're in a place in time where we can affect the process. We can get the outcome that we want. And being a part you know, of Napa, and I was also a part of the Mendocino Cannabis Association, um, it's been really profound and really inspiring to see that what you say right now and how you approach this plant and its use and the way that you want to introduce it to your consumers and customers and friends is going to shape how this plant comes into the light for future generations. So everything that we're doing here today is really important work and everybody's voice counts. It's really, it's a special time. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, we want to share uh, in Humboldt, I mean, we've had decades for our farmers to perfect the best uh, farming practices, um, environmentally friendly, fish friendly, um, closed loop practices, regenerative farming. And so that's what we want to share. Uh, we want to show how you can have a sustainable farm and have your river flow with the coho salmon spawning. I mean, that's what we want to share. We don't want to share a, a giant uh, destructive mega grow. We want to show how to do it correctly and how we have um, been the leaders in that field and have done it correctly and want to help educate and help elevate mm -hmm. um, the whole experience. Or you just warm my heart because my night job is I'm president of the California Fish and Game Commission, so I love everything you just said. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Brian, this is for you. I, give me a kind of a, a few examples of the audience, a few examples of um, what so, sort of cannabis tourism experiences that are, you know, are out there or what we can expect to, to see more of in the future? Yeah, so you have, um, of course, the operating rolling vehicle tour, um, which runs the gamut. Like, again, it's young. So you have so certain people that are more of an Uber taking you to 
dispensaries and you have walking tours in the city that do like a public, like a consumption lounge crawl because San Francisco, San Francisco, and they have beautiful <laughs> consumption lounges right now. Um, you have the heard. Sonoma experience with Jared over there that does kind of a weed, wine, craft beer, you know, kind of the Sonoma brand palette, if you will. Um, my tours are really big on culture and history and education, things like that. You have puff and paints, you have curated experiences with pairings, and again, this also dives into like terpenes, which are in all plants. So we talk about cannabis. I think the default button for a lot of people is THC altered state. And I think continually opening that dialogue up, understanding there's cannabinoids in clover and other things that we talk about cannabinoids, that's not unique to cannabis, that exists. Mm -hmm. We have cannabinoids internally that we produce. And that's a whole biology lesson that there was probably a speaker today that talked about. <laughs> um, but again, I think there's a responsibility, um, getting a little off topic, but you have the puff puff paints, you have, events that are popping up, you have rolling vehicle tours, um, and that's part of the fun, right? I think getting the engagement from people that are non-cannabis, that's a big mission of ours at the association, is to engage members and board members that are not from the cannabis industry proper. Um, so we can really kind of bridge build and see what are your concerns? And here, listen to the, the cannabis community and say, what are your concerns? And then just kind of be this conduit of information for people to like have a safe space to ask questions, get collateral, like we're gonna be producing content, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think it runs the gamut. I think the beautiful thing about cannabis is you have the health and wellness component. In the innovation of tourism, people are gonna have the wider way, or the wide array of like the stoner to grandma who, you know, to the person who honestly, there's medical tourism. They show up here and they're in stage four cancer. They've tried everything. And these are people that arrive at dispensaries. Is that, that's like a medical refugee tourist. So how does that conversation feel to your concierge when they show up in Sonoma and go, yeah, we're on our last leg. Can you tell us what to do? We wanna try cannabis for cancer. And you're sitting there going, wow. But that's what we're experiencing with the new cannabis tourist profile. That's one of them. Yeah, that, I, I hadn't thought about that. That's, that's it's, and it's not, well, it's not a small thing. No, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a thing, significant right? thing. And people that can't get it in their own states are seeking it out in places like California, because where do you want to go, California? I guess I just thought my, you know, my head kind of wrapped around the, you know, my wine industry background, right? So you go to the taste room, and maybe there's a vineyard tour, and where they'll take you in the cellar, we'll do a little barrel tasting. Um, if it's harvest, right, we'll go out there on the, on the crush pad, and we'll watch some of the grapes get dumped into the, the hopper. And, 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 and so will there be... Do you envision tours like that, like around harvest and God willing. The <laughs> From a compliance standpoint, it's not legal right now, but my goodness, won't that be amazing when you can go out and walk amongst these magical plants and then come in and use a CBD topical that makes your arthritis go away? And that's something that we're trying to focus on as well is, is facilitating the educational process of this. Um, you know, our, our farmers have cultivated some of the best strains in the world and, and wanting to share right. uh, share that knowledge. If you right. have somebody that comes in right. and, and building these partnerships here today, I think is, is going to help sustain, sustain the industry itself as well as help who needs to be able to be helped. Right. Right. Pick, picking up on both what Laura and Brian said, you know, about both the environment and about health, we have a real opportunity. You know, cannabis packaging, for instance, was delivered in baggies, you know, Ziploc bags. That was the extent of cannabis <laughs> packaging for, you know, since I was in high school. And turkey bags. Right, and turkey bags, right? <laughs> um, we have a real opportunity right now to set real great examples on the environment in general, on how our packaging is green, on how the vehicles we, we tour in are green vehicles. We need to, to take that advantage of the fact that we're starting from scratch relatively and, and make that part of, an, an integrated part of who and what we are. And I know, you know, in Napa, we have a Napa certified green winery program. And, and, you know, the conversation about sustainable vineyard management is getting, you know, hotter and hotter every single year. I mean, it's something that I firmly believe in, as you might imagine. But um, cannabis is actually going to make us face some of our worst demons in the petrochemical farming industry. Um, you know, you can't grow cannabis next to a vineyard if you're using things that you probably shouldn't be because uh, we, as the cannabis industry, get tested to parts per billion. And you can't go to the Whole Foods right now and get an apple that would pass parts per billion testing. So agricultural drift, water, uh, water uh, cleanliness, air quality, all of these things are going to come into play and I think it's an amazing platform to elevate the conversation that we should all be having anyway. I want to touch too on what you said about um, Crush. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> your pros. Um, the, the, the harvesting of cannabis, I think, is going to emerge. I think it's going to be something where uh, I, I know, because I know, I know it's these small farmers that have been perfecting this craft. It's multi-generational up here. And with, with that kind of history that only time can dictate, you are able to perfect a craft of how do you cure cannabis, how do you harvest it, what is the drying process. And it is an intentional art form. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, with the regulated market, how do we distill that art form? Mm -hmm. What does it look like from our region? What is each farm's narrative? And how do we act as a vessel to communicate what that looks like, right? So I, th I do think it's going to reflect something similar to the seasonal kind of crush that, that they see in the, you know, with wine. I hope and, so. And I think... I think seeing, uh, having our environment that is so diverse to where you have just micro uh, environmental pockets that will sustain a strain that you can't grow 50 miles from there. Okay. So I think that um, sharing that is um, yeah, there's something a that we're going to see. And robust Appalachians program exactly. in a number of, of counties, and, and it's exciting to see how those things are rolling out. Mendocino was, you know, one of the first to do that, and we've been talking about it in Napa. I'm sure Sonoma's having the same conversations, but it's really exciting to think about. Yeah, so one of the things we've said in the draft ordinance we're proposing for, the Na for Napa County is that only out, we're only allowing outdoor growing and, uh, and only an, uh, an acre per parcel. Um, so if, if you're going to put the Napa name on it, it's got to be grown in the soil and in the sun. It's great. Yes. Right. <laughs> so we had a question here, and, uh, and we touched on a little bit of this, but, but I'll throw it out there, and maybe we can pile on a bit. It talk, it, the question is about um, how do we get the, the tourism associations, winery associations, cannabis associations to come together, and are those conversations happening right now? In Napa, is it all, are all three groups meeting at the same time right now? We've been doing it more serial, serially. I imagine when we have our, the first hearing on it on the 28th, it'll, it'll start to come together, uh, everybody in one place. But you know, we, re, we had to reach out to them. It turns out both uh, the Farm Bureau and, well, there's, we, have, we have four different groups that touch on grapes, the grape growers, the wine growers, the Farm Bureau, right. and the vintners. Um, all of them had had initial discussions, but didn't even know how to discuss it, really. So we reached out to each of them. We met with their, they each created a cannabis committee or selected a few people to talk to us. And it was, it was like Brian was saying earlier, it began an education process mm -hmm. and a communication process. It led to the point where they actually gave us you know, ideas for what they wanted to see in the ordinance and what they wouldn't want allowed. Um, and we, it's, just an, it's, it's, it's blossoming from there. But um, I was actually very surprised at the lack of fear about it. There are some winery owners who just, not over my dead body, but they're relatively few. Our board has names like Stephanie Honing, who's in the room, who's our president of, of our association, Rob Mandavi, the Renteria family. Um, you know, we, we've both been in the wine business. So um, it's not that cannabis in Napa is being started by people who aren't in the wine business against right. the wine folks. Right. It's that we have to convince the few folks who are kind of skeptical yeah. or scared that it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Brian, you have, you have any I was going to say, George, that's, that's your job. To get everybody in the same room? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. I'm working at it. Uh, I, I, you know, just to kind of pile on, you know, I've, I found it very interesting, you know, of course, you know, being based here in Sonoma County and where I spent my, my entire wine career, and I still uh, am partners in a small wine brand, that the, you know, the perception that I've seen over here has been a little bit standoffish, you know, kind of wait and see, you know, and, and not so much uh, a proactive approach you know, with one, you know, with, with some of what we chat about with Eric, it's like, you know, there's a certain inevitability, this is happening, okay, so how do we manage what's going to happen anyway versus, you know, ignore it or hope it goes away, um, which I know there is some of that out there. All right. Um, I think the wait and see time is is pretty much over, and that's something that we're, we've we've jumped in and trying to navigate it through um, daily, really, with policies and procedures that are changing. And you know that's something that the, our visitor bureau has. Um, tried to build the bridges to work with the lodging industry, to work with our farm associations, um, to work um, with our chambers of commerce, to, to bring everyone together, and, and primarily, you know, why we're here today, to, to build these partnerships. And, and the ordinances aren't really in, in place right now for us to say, sure, come on in to all our farms, and it's open door, and consume. That's not the picture that we're trying to portray, but when that time, and hopefully when that time comes, we've already are building these partnerships. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's, that's a big part of our goal, really. Mm -hmm. and, About, and that, include, that includes you know, uh, groups that deal with youth, because that's often one of the first pushbacks, right, is what about our kids? You know, reach out to them, get them involved in the process, because we, we have good answers, and we want to support keeping kids away from it. 
Right. And in wine country in particular, there is, I just want to touch on that, there is actually studies uh, out of Colorado and other states that were first to legalize that told us two things. One, underage consumption of marijuana went down when it was legalized. That was number one. It was our first finding. The other thing is, and Colorado did a big study on this, that fatal DUIs have gone down, I think, something like th close to 30% since cannabis has been legalized in the state. That's a profound thing to talk about when we're talking about so, all these people drinking wine and driving around our roads. These are things that we should be embracing and, and helping to promote. Somebody had a question, there was actually a few people liked it, um, about wineries, tasting rooms, winery properties being 420 friendly. And I think Rebecca, you cannot, that's not happening, well, so, right? So but, you can't have a retail license and a, for alcohol and for cannabis on the same facility. It doesn't, you know, it, we were talking about this at lunch. Private consumption? You know, you, private consumption. So for instance, if a delivery service delivered cannabis to a person who happens to be at your winery, it's in the gray area at this point. Okay, so, so hey, the, I'm, on the, I'm on the deck right now overlooking the vineyard. Right. I'll, I'll be right there. I, it, it is, okay. Please right. deliver. And we've got this okay. two issues, right? We've got, we've got the ABC saying, the, the state saying that the ABC will not allow you to have both licenses. And then, of course, if you have a, a winery license, you're also li licensed by the federal government. So right. there's some real risk at that until we have federal legalization. I sure would like to see the, them be allowed on the same property over time. And I think we'll get there. Um, it's, you know, even if the state allowed it now, you wouldn't want to do it because of the federal issue. So we're, we're getting close to time here. I give you guys Smoke kind of a chance lot. to. Yeah. <laughs> um, any any final comments, Laura, for the for the audience on the, on this topic that you uh, want to share? Or well, uh, you know, uh, we're we're really um, in in some changing times right now, and and we want to welcome you up to Humboldt County and 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 um, you know use our Southern Humboldt Business and Visitor Bureau as a guide um, to help you kind of navigate through that experience. And, and we wanna share our best practices and we wanna share our environment and we wanna share our giant redwood trees and, and the magic that we have up in Humboldt County. So come visit us. Anybody else, any other parting comments? Yeah, I wanna go back to your question about associate, associations collaborating. Yeah. So uh, the California Cannabis Tourism Association this year got invited down to the Cal Travel Summit in San Diego as the standalone kind of cannabis tourism representation there. We had a standing room only breakout session. The level of interest is high. This is the greater travel and tourism industry. Most importantly, I think that just signified a level of acceptance that the wave is now kind of cresting and we need to figure out what it is and start the dialogue. Um, so I wanted to share that. Um, again, I'm Brian Applegarth with Emerald Country Tours. Um, I'm big on the heritage and cultural aspect. I'd say even aside from bottom line and how you're gonna carve into the piece of the pie and those conversations aside, um, like the statistic Alicia gave about you know, how the uh, fatal car accidents has dropped in, in Colorado. What is, you know, you touched on how you can message about sustainable cultivation. The really interesting part about something coming out of prohibition is you all of a sudden have a megaphone to the kind of mainstream society tipping in. And it's not just conversations about cannabis, it's about all the other things that it makes space for, like sustainable growing, biodynamic cultivation, um, uh, compassion, right? Like, where did this, what was this born out of? How did cannabis get legalized in the first place, do we know? There's a huge history of activism that's really fascinating, and it happened in our corridor. So there's all these other kind of layers around cannabis that make it really fun, and you can, I mean, the hippie side of me feels like you can have a positive impact on your community, the way people treat each other, the way people intentionally live and interact. And that's a big part of the cannabis core that I hope never goes away. Absolutely. And I'll say, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll say that, um, you know, uh, Max at the V Foundation, which is a, a um, cancer research and um, uh, nonprofit organization, um, you know, he, he said to me one day, cancer doesn't care how much money you have. And, it, you know, inviting in something that is all about health and wellness of people and planet is never going to be a bad thing. Um, it's always going to create a positive change and a positive effect. And that positive effect is going to ripple out and help us change the world to be a better place. And that's why I got into cannabis. And I hope that everybody here today thinks about the cannabis that they're buying and the farmers that they're supporting and the farming practices that they're endorsing and incorporating into their own vineyards and their own gardens and um, into their own lives and go out there and you are now educators, right? We all are at the tip of the spear. We're all on the front of the wave. Um, everybody here now has a responsibility to go out and, and educate the next person. So I hope you do. Yeah, absolutely. Really well said. Um, <laughs> you know, we've talked mainly today about 
geographic areas, work, counties primarily working on uh, internally working together. It's just as important that all of the counties in the, in, you know, in, in the North Coast, including Lake and Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, and Trinity, that we all work together, and we have been. Um, but or the rising tide that lifts all boats within a county is going to lift this industry if we all work together. It's, it's a friendly kind of competition. We've shown in Napa that when wineries work together, you do much better than when you try to go it on your own. And that same goes for all of the counties working together. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, and I guess it's just, you know, it's been, this has been a very educational experience for me, not just, you know, the, the time that I've spent with, with you guys, but, but just the time that I've spent with uh, a lot of people from both industries talking about, you know, what's happening right now. And I guess for me, um, is this opportunity that uh, the pie is going to get bigger, right? And by finding ways to work together, um, California, Northern California in particular has always been known for wheat and wine, right? So that's not, mm -hmm. that's not new. Um, but be able to, you know, with the idea of uh, both industries being able to pull their resources, uh, to your point, where it's an all ships rise with the tides situation for, for everyone, uh, seems like a real, you know, reality. Um, so I want to thank this panel, thank the panel. Great job, you guys. You. Give a big hand. Um, and George, I want to I want to thank you. I don't know if you get enough kudos, but thank American. you for putting this thank together. You. Well, no, this is great. I love it. Um, we've got um, a 15 minute break. Get a glass of wine. Hope the wines can be ready, Samantha. Right? We've got some wine out there. Okay. Uh, have a glass of wine, and uh, we've got um, our final session. It, we'll, we'll, we've got actually two sessions. One's going to be uh, our second workshop, uh, Lessons from Wine, talking about distributor management. And, uh, and then we've got our final session here, Business Opportunities at Cannabis Presents the Wine. So we'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.